episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the road they traveled to get there. Now, this brother who we have on the show today, I'm so honored and impressed with his resume. I'm happy because he and I spoke about a month or two ago, and I knew immediately just with his spirit and his energy, I had to get him on the platform. He specializes in educating and training people on the industry of trucking. He has the number one podcast in the trucking industry called Trucking Hustle. Please welcome to this week's show, Mr. Ramel Watley. Ramel, what's up, brother? Yo, what's up, Sean? How are you, man? What's going I'm, on, brother? I'm good. I'm good. I'm smiling because behind the scenes, we got a lot of things going on, but it's all good. <laughs> but thank we you do, again. But listen, we're we going to make it work, man. You know what I'm saying? The show must go on, brother. The show, the show must, must go, on. go on. You know how that go. That's a fact. Now, but like I was saying, Rod, like, truth be told, I, I, I loved your energy from the first time we ever spoke. Um, and I love what you're doing out there. There's so many people who uh, are from our communities who don't know a lot about the trucking industry, but what you're doing in terms of sharing your knowledge, sharing your education and your wisdom, and just educating people on how to get in this industry and how to really excel at it, I think it's admirable and I gotta give it up to you because you're a person after my own heart. No doubt. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, man. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on your platform and, and share my story. You know, usually I'm I'm the man asking the questions. So so this this isn't the comfortable seat for me, but I'm going to do my best to live up to the standard, man. I've, I've, I've been following your show. You have some amazing guests. You ask some really dope questions, man. And I love it, man. So so let's get it, brother. I'm ready. All right, let's get into it, brother. Like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview, and I think you are going to help so many aspiring power move makers out there. So tell me a little bit about your backstory, and I want to bring it up because, I, I, I'm for me, I don't know a lot about the trucking industry, yeah. and I know that this is an industry that people can make a lot of money at. You're the yeah. expert. So I yeah. want to hit you with as many, as long as your time permits, I want to hit you with as many questions that I personally want to know and I think are going to help people who are either trying to get into the industry or they're in it and they're trying to work their way up. How did you even get into this industry? No doubt. So I'll start with saying that I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm more of an enthusiast. I'm more of a practitioner. I'm more of a, a student of the game. Right. I don't think we could ever really be experts. I think we're always learning. And, and, and every day is something new, especially yep. in transportation. Transportation is so wide and so vast of a of, of an industry. And there's so many different niches and so many different uh, areas of transportation and of the industry that you can never really be an expert. You know what I mean? So we're always learning. Well, um, said. In terms of how well I, said. In, in terms of how I got into the industry, Sean, it's really interesting because, you know, I actually just kind of stumbled in this industry. Growing up, you know, I, I, I grew up, I come from Brooklyn, um, just 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 really quick, come from Brooklyn um, and, you know, moved to, moved to Jersey as a young kid. And growing up, I, I wanted to be a rapper, right? That was my thing. So when I used to see truck truckers or, or anything re re regarding a truck, you know, there, there was really nobody that looked like me. Or, or, or nothing that inspired me there to make me want to say, hey, man, I, I want to do that when I grow up or whatever the case may be. I didn't feel like there was a place for me there. And just and that was literally just like the exposure. I didn't have exposure. I didn't, I didn't know anybody who was in the industry to really understand that that was that would be an opportunity for me. Um, but, you know, to, to, to kind of fast forward a little bit, the way I got into the industry was really, man, out of desperation, man. You know, I, I, I was at a point in my life early. I was about 20, 20, 21 years old, and I was just looking for work. I was looking for a job, and I was trying to figure out something that I could do that could make me money immediately, right? So, you know, just looking through the paper and trying to, you know, back then you look through a paper, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Try, <laughs> you, trying to figure out, like, what, what makes sense, you know what I mean? And I had done, done other things previously. You know, I've always had an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit. I, I've had different businesses prior to that. You know, but at this time, you know, those things didn't work out but and I needed money. So I looked through and I found, you know, hey, man, get your CDL. You can make 50,000. You can make 75,000. You can make, you know, you know, diff this amount of money. And there was plenty of jobs, plenty of opportunities. So I'm like, man, this sounds like it makes sense. So at this time, I'm literally like on unemployment. Right. So um, 
the where I was at, they were actually paying people to go, paying for people to go to truck driving school. So although it was something that was foreign to me, I was like, man, you know, hey, man, you know, if I could, you know, do this thing, drive a truck, it seems easy enough. I can get into this industry and I can make some decent money for myself. So I did that. You know, I went to truck driving school. Um, you know, that in itself was an experience because it was just something new. Uh, you know, I had to learn how to shift the gears. I, at, at this time, I didn't even know how to drive a manual car. Right. I still was driving the automatic. So I had to learn, you know, the, the, the different speeds of the gears. You got 10 speed truck, 13 speed. So, you, you know, you, you have to learn. It's, it's, a, it's a full learning curve. Right. So I did that. This trucking school probably took about and, and, and you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, because it was, this was a while ago, but it probably was about maybe six weeks. Right. Six weeks for the course. And after that, you take your you, you, you take your uh, they, they, they take you. You have to take you have to actually pass like a written test first. Mm-hmm. Right. And after you pass the written test, then you have to do your road test. Right. Stop, so stop there for one second. I want to because I, I, I want to, to get as uh, in the weeds as humanly possible in this interview. OK. Number one, you said you were on unemployment and this course was offered for free. Do you know if, if, if these courses are still offered for free or if it was yeah. just during the time that you took it? And then secondly, you said it was a, how, how long was it? A six week class or six months? I believe it was about six weeks that it took me for, to actually get my CDL. By the six the six week, I was actually taking my road test. Okay, so what, what do the classes look like? Are they five days a week? Are they, you know, seven in the morning to three in the afternoon? Just give us an idea of what these classes look like. Yeah, so to answer the first question, uh, yes, I do believe, now I haven't looked into it recently, Mm-hmm. But I do believe that you can usually go to whatever any town, like most cities, mm-hmm. like if you go through unemployment, they usually offer some sort of uh, program to where they'll sponsor people to go get their CDLs. They have uh, different relationships with different truck driving schools. Like, you know, in Jersey, where I'm at, there's like there's Allstate, there's Smith and Solomon. And usually what they do in order to encourage people to come into their school, because obviously they're getting this money, you know, from the government. They So they, it's encour- they're, they're encouraging people to come into the school. So they'll have relationships with with uh, with the city and they'll send they'll, they'll basically sponsor people to come to the school. So that's how I got in. If you paid out of pocket, it's going to cost you about four thousand dollars at the time. Right. So I'm not sure that number may have changed, Mm -hmm. you know, since then. But it was around four thousand dollars at the time. But I was sponsored. I got in for free Um, in in terms of uh, the 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 uh, the time period. It took I believe it was a daily course for six weeks. I I believe I was there every day, maybe maybe three or four days out of the week. Maybe we had one day off. But for the most part, it was every day during the week for about six weeks. So they take you through different steps, like the first at first, they're going to the first couple of weeks, you go through the written portion. Right. You learn how to do like your logs. Right. So like you're in a time, classroom. You're, you're doing classroom. So stuff, even right? though you're, you're learning about being on the road, the first half of the classes are in the classroom understanding. And you can go into it. I'm assuming all of the basics. Um, yes. A hundred percent. So they're going to teach, teach you, obviously, like the rules and regulations of the road. Right. They're going to teach you about different things like, you know, um, like safety, compliance. At that time, they're teaching up, teaching you how to log. Like now they have what they call e-logs, like electronic logs to where you don't do manual logs anymore. But when I got my CDL, you actually had to write out your logs and your logs are basically the time that you drive every day. Because as a driver, you're only allowed to drive for 11 hours in one day and you're allowed to drive and work combination 11 hours and uh, 14 hours of on of, of on duty. So you can't have a, a work day longer than 14 hours. So every day you have to log those days because if you get pulled over, right, um, the Department of Transportation, they're going to want to see your logs and they want to make sure you're not driving illegally. So that's one of the most important aspects of driving. You have to know how to log your time. But now, you know, obviously it's almost 20 years later. Everything is everything is automated. Everything is, you know, computers and technology. Now you do all that on a computer and you have to, you know, show the the uh, the police officer your e-logs and they can look through it the same exact way. So, yeah, they're teaching you all the fundamentals and all the things that you're going to need kind of behind behind the seat outside of the driving before you actually go out there and, and actually drive. So so during that time, we're learning that. And then you have to actually take a test. Right. Uh to pass that 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 written is a they call it the written portion, 
right? So you 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 take that test, and that's going to be like on all the concepts and different things, um, you know, that that kind of just discussed, like compliance and all those kind of things, right? And then after you take that test in two weeks, once you pass that portion, you can also take your endorsements as well. Now, as a driver, you have different different endorsements. You could be a, have a passenger endorsement. You could have a hazmat endorsement. I, I'm I'm sorry. Again, this is your world. It's not mine. What, okay. what is an endorsement? I, all I, right. I know so what that means in general term. An endorsement allows you as a driver to do specialized, uh, different specialized things. Right. So you could have your CDL. So, to, OK, so to break it down, the top CDL you could have is a CDL class A. Right. That class A is the top type of uh, license you could have. Right. That allows you to drive a tractor trailer and anything below it. Right. So you, if you have a CDL class A, you could drive a tractor trailer, any combination vehicle. Right. You could also drive things like like uh, dump trucks. You can drive like waste management trucks. And you can drive all the way down to straight trucks, box trucks, whatever you want to drive, right? Stay there for one second. Is, yeah. there, is there more required of you? Is there more schooling? Is it more money? Like, in order to get that class A, is it more required of you um, in terms of, of the schooling for you to get that class A? No. So, so it depends on what you go to school for. So some people go to school to get their class B, right? Your class B is like if you want to be a bus driver. So you don't have to get your class A, but if you get your class A, it covers everything, yep. right? So I always advise people, if you're going to get a CDL, you might as well get the class A because that will allow you to drive any type of vehicle, right? Now, the what the endorsements are, are those are add-ons, right? So what the endorsement does, and, and basically what you have to do is you have to take uh, specific t tests, written tests, in order to get those endorsements. So for example, hazmat. Right. A hazmat endorsement allows you to haul chemicals. Right. Things are that are corrosive. Right. Things that, you know, can poison you. Right. So that that's a part that's a written portion that you have to pass because it lets it, it, it shows that you understand what the placards are and, and the different compliance that goes into hauling hazardous material. Right. So that that that's the hazmat endorsement. You could also get your passenger endorsement. Right. So now your passenger endorsement allows you to carry people. Right. Drive a bus. Right. Then you have doubles. You have triples. So a lot of times you'll see tractor trailers on the road. You'll see one trailer. If you get your doubles and your triples, now you can have a trailer and you can have two trailers hooked up or sometimes three trailers hooked up. But that takes that's furthering your education. And that's a different endorsement that you have to have on that license. So all, all that stuff will be on your license. If somebody looks at your license, they'll show that you have a class A. And on the back, it'll show that you have these specific endorsements, additional endorsements, P passenger endorsement, hazmat endorsement. And, and that just basically makes you more marketable. You, you have more opportunity with more endorsements because you can do more jobs. You can do things that everybody else can do. It's like being a Navy SEAL. You know what I mean? Like you can be a you could be in the Marines, but if you're like a Navy SEAL, now you're yep. kind of specialized. You have a specialized training that allows you to go a little bit further. And obviously, if you know if you have specialties, you can charge more too, right? You can you can you can when you work, you're going to get paid more because because of uh, because of your knowledge. You know what I mean? So when you go into like specialized endorse uh, endorsements like hazmat, you can get more pay because not everybody has a hazmat. And it also costs more for you to carry that hazmat on your license as well. Like when you renew your license, you got to renew your endorsements and you got to pay more to renew it and so forth and so on. To all my movers, if you love educational and inspirational content just like this, please like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. But most important, if you know anybody making power moves just like you, share it. Now back to the video. Quick question for you before we move on. If I got my class A, I hit the streets, I can drive pretty much anything. But if I wanted to get endorsements, do I go back to school for it? Like, what does that look like? Do I have to get the endorsements at the same time I get my CDL? Or can I always go back for it at any point in my career? You, you, you could always go back for it. Okay. At any point in your career, you can go back if you want to add, because I mean, that happens. I mean, you start your career in one place and then you see other opportunities and you say, hey, man, you know, that looks interesting. You know, I'd like to try that. But, you know, if you don't have the endorsement, you can't do it. So, yeah, you can go back past that test and then you could get that endorsement added onto your license. OK, wonderful. I'm going to just ask you a straight up question. Yeah. 
in 2021, is it worth it to become a truck driver? Hmm. Plain That's and great. simple. That's a great question. And, 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 and what I'll say is that depends on who you are as an individual, right? Elaborate. Okay. So here's the thing, right? Truck drivers are in high demand, right? Why? So as a truck driver with a clean license, and I'm going to stress with a clean license, mm -hmm. right? Because if you don't have a clean license, you might as well not even have the license because you can't be, in, you're not employable, right? A truck driver with a clean license has what I call a golden ticket, right? They can pretty much get a job anywhere, everywhere, anytime, whenever, because there's so much demand for truck drivers and specifically good truck drivers, right? And when I say good, not just only the license, but people who are dependable, right? People who, you know, have the right attitude, who are going to represent your company in the right way. There's so much different variables to being a, being a driver that when you, when, when, you, when you have that, when you have all those attributes, you literally can go anywhere, walk in the door and, and you can have a job, right? So let's mm -hmm. hold that there. Mm -hmm. So in terms of being uh, having a, a opportunity, yes, it's it's the greatest. It's probably the greatest job in the world because there's so much opportunity. You can pretty much get a job anytime you want to. And to further that along, the barrier to entry in starting your own business in trucking is pretty low, right? You don't got to go to school for four years to start a trucking company. You just have to educate yourself, right? So you can quickly uh, transfer into entrepreneurship you know, in your trade. You can drive for someone for a couple of years and say, hey, you know what? I want to get my own truck and I want to start, I want to get my own authority and I want to start pulling my own freight, right? So there's plenty of opportunity, plenty of upside, right? The downside is when you're a truck driver, it's a very rough quality of life, right? The quality of life is very difficult. Um, you know, you don't have home time a lot, you know, unless you have a, a, a job that's local, that's getting you home every day. You're spending a lot of time over the road. You know, health wise, it, it impacts your health because you're over the road so much. You're not eating the right way, you know, so you find a lot of drivers, you know, they get their license, they start gaining weight. They, they, they're not as healthy as they were prior to the license. Right. It's a very thankless business to where it's so cutthroat that you're really a number. You know, you're really just another driver. So the, the work you do, even if you go above and beyond, a lot of times you're not going to get recognized for the things you do. So if you need to be patted on the back every day and you need a, a, a data boy and you, you're a person who needs to find, you know, you, you find solace in, in, in people, you know, giving you that love, maybe trucking isn't for you because the, the love's not there. Right. So it really depends on your goals and the kind of person that you are, how resilient you are. And if you could get up every day and, 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 and get up and do that thankless job that nobody's going to really appreciate you for, then, then you can make it happen in this trucking industry. Because at the end of the day, there's a light at the end of the tunnel because there's opportunity there. And mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, the, the road is, you know, start in the truck and work your way out of the truck to where you're employing other people, you know, where you have other people coming up. And, and now you're showing them, showing them the ropes and you're bringing them through the, the, the same pipeline that you came through. And now you can fall back a little bit because you understand the industry. You understand how to make the money. And now you don't have to work as hard. The thing is, a lot of people get stuck in the truck and they end up retiring out the truck. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong, because people there, there's people who will have their, you know, their one truck and, and, and they, they may have their own authority and they'll have their business and they'll just go, you know, go uh, across the country and they love it and they'll do it their whole life. And they'll just retire and say, man, I lived a great life, you know, but for a good majority of people to hustle and the bustle of trucking, you know, the, 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 uh, the wear and tear it, it puts on your body because it's also a physical job. It could be very physically demanding, right? Mm -hmm. Because not only are you driving, but in a lot of cases you're unloading trailers, right? You, 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 you're getting out, you're, 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 you're humping, you're, you're humping what they call humping freight, right? You, you, you got to pull thousand, thousand pound pallets of, of water and groceries and you're going upstairs with this stuff and you're going downstairs with this stuff. And like I said, it's a lot. It takes a toll on you. And then not to mention just your body not getting the proper rest. Right. You, they, they have what they call your circadian rhythm where, you, you know, your body gets REM sleep. Right. You, you're supposed to get the, the, the proper rest when you're a driver. You don't get proper rest because your, your, your rest is always interrupted. 
You know, even if you're in a, a loading dock waiting to be unloaded or loaded, you know, you, you're trying to get some rest. Somebody's knocking on your door. Hey, pull out the door. Do this. Do that. <laughs> so you, you you never have a moment of, you know, of, of peace, you know, while you're out there on the road. So it's a very, very rough lifestyle. You know what I mean? So when you say, is it worth it to go back to your question? It depends on where you're at in your journey and in your life. I would say, you know, for, for younger people, you know, trying to find way, find a way and, and, and find opportunities, it's absolutely worth it because now your time, your, your body is at the point to where you could probably take a little bit of a beating, you know, and, and take a licking and keep on ticking. If you're going to take it, take it while you're young, you That's know what right. I mean? And, and, and get yourself in position to where as you age a little bit, you could work your way out of the truck. But to, 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 to do it as an older person, it takes a toll on you. And like I said, I know plenty of drivers who are in their 50s, 60s, even 70s, and they got it mastered. They got it mastered. They, they make it, they, they do it, they make it look like it's so easy. You know what I'm saying? But for the average person just looking at this, you know, from the outside looking in and they want to jump into this, these are kind of the things that I would want them to consider. Really think about your goals and think about what you want to do with this trucking industry before you get into it. Got you. Uh, you gave a great, great answer. Um, you mentioned the word getting your authority a couple of times. Yeah. Educate us. What All is right. It? So basically, as, as a driver, you can work for someone, right? You can You can pull freight underneath someone's company, right? So I try to simplify it as easy as possible. So typically when you get your CDL, you become a driver, you're going to go look for a job. A job. That person who has who, who who's employing you has what they call, uh, they have a DOT number and they have a motor carrier authority. That authority is what allows them to lawfully pull freight within the United States, right? So that authority comes with obviously fees, right? They, they, they're paying for that authority. So in order to get that authority, you have to go through a, 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 a process, right? That has a lot of paperwork, a lot of different compliance, all right? And, and then also you become insured, right? As a carrier. So you have to get a certain amount of liability insurance, a certain amount of bobtail insurance, a certain amount of cargo insurance. This is just in case something happens on the road, which something always happens. So this is what's basically protecting you and protecting your company, as a motor carrier. So that's what your authority is. So when you, as a driver, when you first start driving, if you don't have your own authority, you're driving for someone else, yep. right? You can even have your own truck, but go under someone else's uh, under someone else's authority to where you have your own truck and, and, and you you have your your bobtail insurance for that truck. So you're you're the basically the your company is a truck and you, right? But you're going underneath their authority and you're pulling freight underneath their uh, their umbrella. First, I'm just trying to make it easier without complicating yep. it for the audience, right? So when you get your own authority, you're kind of doing your own thing. Now you have the opportunity to look for your own loads and you're kind of cutting out the middleman. When you have your own authority, now you have the opportunity to make more money because there's nobody that's cutting into that pie. The money is coming directly to you now, your company, and now you can pay that to yourself, your company, and then your drivers if you have some. Okay. Was that was that clear enough? It was clear enough. Okay. I, I think I, you know, I, I'm I'm nowhere close to this industry, and I get it. <laughs> okay. So cool. so you did a great job answering. Thank that. you. All right. Cool. I just want to make sure everybody understands. And if not, feel free to say you know say it again or whatever the case may be. No, nah, you did an excellent job. Okay. I want to go backwards for a second because we talked about going to school. You graduate. Sean Prez. I get my CDL, I'm happy. I, I, I just spent six weeks of my life working on this. I'm ready to go out there and make some money. Yeah. What do I do? Where mm. do I go? Like, how do I get my first job? Like, what does that look like? So here's the thing. At, at that point, that, that's what we call, um, <laughs> I, that's probably the worst, the, probably the worst time in a truck driver's life at that point, right? Because as I, as I stated earlier, your license is really only as good as the experience that you have, right? So when you when you when you first graduate and you get your license, your license is clean, clean slate, right? But there's no miles on that license. You have no experience. So what's going to happen is you have to, in most cases, and this is not all the time, but in most cases, you got to do what they call OTR or go over the road, right? So what happens when you go over the road? 
there's going to be a whole bunch of companies that's going to come at you and they're going to say, all right, Mr. Green truck driver who's never driven before. Stop, we stop, know that- stop, stop before you. What is over the road? What, what is okay, that? So over the road basically means that you're 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 driving a truck. 48 states. You're 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 in Jersey one day. You're in California the next. You're in Wyoming the next. You're 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 in Nebraska. You're all over the place. Basically, that company is sending you everywhere and anywhere. You're not coming home. Gotcha. Your bed is that truck. You live in that truck, right? And 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 most people have to go through that rite of passage before they're able to get the experience on their license to where they'll be able to get hired locally because most local jobs aren't gonna hire somebody fresh out of school because here again, the liability. All companies have criteria that they put in place and also their insurance is gonna put in place because their insurance is not gonna allow them to hire a brand new driver. Because if a driver wrecks a truck or kills a family of four, your company's done, right? So we're, 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 we're talking about one of the most high risk jobs in, in, in the world. Right. So you have to have that experience in, under your belt and not only that experience, but with that experience, you have to show that you have been a good driver during that time. Right. So you have what they call MVR, your motor vehicle record. Right. So anytime you get hired, a company is going to pull your MVR. They're going to look at your tickets. Right. How many tickets have you had? How many violations have you had? Have you had reckless driving? Have you had a DUI? All these things. And what's very important is. Not only is it going to not only does your your CDL driving career impact you, but also prior to you getting your CDL impacts you as well. Right. So even before you looked, they're looking at that whole picture of are you careless or not? Can we trust you with our truck? Right. So in order to build up that profile, it takes you about at least minimum six months, minimum six months. And before, back in the day, the criteria would be a year to two years before you'd be able to get hired locally. But now, because there's such a shortage and companies are scrambling for drivers, they're, they're, they're lowering the, the, the standard, right? Which is good and bad because they're lowering the standard. So they're bringing newer drivers on, which those drivers aren't, they don't have enough training in a lot of cases. So they're more high risk when they start to work for these companies. Right. But it's like one of those things where they have to do it because there's not enough drivers. So they have to lower the standards. But when I started driving, the standards were like it was like, man, you have to drive for at least a year. And usually that's over the road because those are the companies that's going to hire you. Now, the other side to that is there those companies are hiring you, but they're not paying you well because they understand that you have no choice. Right. Your back is up against the wall. They know the game. You're in a position to where in order for you to get that job that you want, you have to go through this rite of passage. You have to work for me for six months. So I'm going to pay you next to nothing, but I'm going to train you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to put you with, with somebody. You're going to learn the ropes. You're not going to make a lot of money. But during this time, you know, you're going to be able to get your license to a point to where you can get that other job. So they use you in effect for that time. They pay you under market value because you really don't have a choice, right? So you're gonna take that time and you and you just have to pretty much bite it and eat it. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, now times have changed a bit because of supply and demand. There's, le less, little, little, there's less supply and the demand is heavy. So now companies are saying, all right, six months on the road, come on, we'll try you out. Cause they don't have a choice, but still you have to have some type of experience before you're gonna be able to get that $75,000 a, 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 a year job and up that most truck drivers are looking for. You understand? Uh, yep, absolutely. If the barrier of entry to become a driver is six weeks of school, get your CDL, why, I keep hearing you mention that there are so few drivers. They're in high demand. Why is this? Yeah. Was it has it always been like this? Is this just something in modern day? Why is this such a shortage of drivers? Yeah, so th there's there's a few reasons. So yes, th to answer your question, yes, it's been like this for a while. Right? It's 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 always been a shortage, right, of drivers. So the the reasons why that 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 I think, 
you know, based on my experience is one, it, let's, let's take it current now, right? Now, a lot of the drivers are either retiring, right? Because because most truck, the average truck driver is probably 40, like 40-ish, right? 35, 40 years old, right? The average truck driver, the, 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 the drivers are retiring out and they're leaving the industry, right? They've been driving for 20 years. They've been driving for 30 years. They're all retiring. They're, 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 they're dying off, unfortunately, or they're retiring out the game. They're just done, right? They can't take it anymore. It's, it's over. The problem is, is that pipeline isn't being filled, filled with new talent. Because if you look at the world today, these young kids ain't trying to drive a truck, right? Look, these young kids are not even trying to play sports anymore. They'll rather sit behind a computer and play video games. Right. So there's not enough people coming into the industry, but there's a lot of people going out of the industry. So you got a big gap there. Right. Not to mention all the other things mentioned previously. It's not the greatest job in the world. You know what I'm saying? In terms of just um, you know, the toll it takes on your body, the the the, the being out, the, the, the thanklessness of it, all these different variables. It's, it's not fun. It's not a fun job. You can get paid good money, but. There's other things. You could become a YouTuber nowadays and make more than being a trucker. You know, you might as well go around and, you know, uh, do pranks or something like that and get a YouTube <laughs> channel and get a million views. <laughs> so, so that's what the kids are seeing now. So where's the incentive to get these young kids into the industry to drive trucks? It's not a lot of incentive, right? So there's a lot, there's not enough people that are coming into the industry and there's a lot of people who are leaving the industry. And that's why that gap keeps on widening and widening and widening to where you have this huge disparity of not enough drivers. And, and, and that's pretty much the way, that's what I think is, is, is pretty much happening. Okay. Let's talk money for a second. Yep. I'm a new driver. How much money, if I'm a new full-time driver, yeah. How much money can I look to make annually? And if I'm a driver who's just, well, I, I, I'll ask this in three different ways. Yeah. If I'm a full-time new driver, if I'm a, eh, not necessarily new, but I don't drive all the time. I drive when I can get hired, but I'm not working for somebody day to day. Yeah. And then a more experienced driver like you said, the average driver is in their mid 30s, 40s, 50s. Like, what are those guys making? What can I look forward to as a driver? Right. So, number one, it depends on your region, right? It depends on where you're at mm -hmm. because the pay scale differs based on where you live, right? The pace, just like, you know, a lot of different jobs. Like, if, if you're in, you know, New York, New Jersey, you get higher pay, right? Because the cost of living is higher so forth and so on. So you'll get, you get higher pay. If you're in the South, like you're in Georgia, you're going to get lower pay because the cost of living is lower, right? So you have to kind of, you have to uh, weigh that into it. Um, it also depends on your experience, right? And, and where you work and what type of, uh, what, what you're doing, right? So let's kind of break down different things. So you can do what they call, um, like dropping hooks, right? There's a thing called dropping hooks to where you don't touch any freight. In other words, you're not doing any physical work, right? All you're doing is taking a trailer from point A to point B, right? Something like that because it's easier as far as the physical demand, they're gonna pay less to do that job because there's no physical strain on your body. But if you're doing something like delivering groceries, right? So where you're, you're moving around a pallet jack and you're actually putting stuff in the store, they're going to have to pay a premium on that because you're actually physically doing work. You know what I mean? Then you have specialties, like I said, hazmat, these different specialties, or if you know how to uh, uh, pull like hev hev heavy, ho heavy haul, like pulling like heavy equipment, you know, things that everybody can't do or everybody doesn't have the experience doing, they have to pay a premium on that. So it really depends on what part of the industry you're in and what you know how to do that's going to impact your bottom line in terms of pay. Because so the more the, the the more skills you have, the more you can get paid. Okay, so I know that there's not one answer because it varies. You just list a ton of variables. But if I'm getting in the industry, yeah, Sean Press just graduated. I'm excited. 
And I got my first job. Yeah. Can I look to make six figures? Am, am I am I somewhere in the area? If I if I have no specialties, I, I don't have any hazmat endorsements, I don't have any passenger endorsements, none of that stuff. Am, am I fifty thousand dollar a year worker? Am I seventy? Is there any kind of idea? Yeah. And I know that there's a ton of variables that you can say, oh well you should be able to make between 60 and 75,000. And if I've been on the job for 20 plus years, right? am, am, am I making a couple of hundred thousand dollars? Like what, what does that look like? Just a base salary. Right. So I, I'll do it based on my experience in, in my region and what I know. Right. So okay. I, live, I, I live in Jersey. Uh, so in, in Jersey, if, like you said, you're Sean Prez, you just got your, you, you, you got your job or whatever the case may be. I'm going to say you can look to make anywhere starting out, probably anywhere from 50 to, let's say, $65,000 okay. kind of starting out, right? As you, a, a, as you uh, mature and, and, and you become more tenured with a company, there's usually more incentives to uh, raise that salary. But also another thing that plays a big part in, in it is how much you're willing to work. Because a lot of companies offer opportunities to where you can work overtime, where you can do extra routes. You know, so if you're a hustler coming into the game, you can have a base of maybe 50 to 65. But there may be more opportunities for you to pull a, a, additional loads within whatever company you work for that can quickly jump that. 50 to six, 50 to 75 to six figures. It depends on how much, what your hustle is. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times there, there's, there's a ceiling, but the ceiling has a lot of room. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of room depending on your hustle, depending on if you're able to have good relationships with your dispatchers and the people that you work with, cause they'll take care of you. You know, if you, if you, if you're good and you know how to network, Worker, you know how to you got a good mouthpiece on you, you might be able to get a little bit of extra work here and there. But ultimately, your 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 paycheck is going to be determined by how hard you work in a lot of cases. So if you're making six figures, you're doing six figure manual work. Not six figure mind work, you're doing six figure manual work. You're probably working a lot harder than most drivers, but it's but it's very possible to do it. But that again, your body is going to take a toll on you, it's going to be a lot of running so forth and so on. It's very seldom that you're going to have an easy drop and hook door to door job with nothing else involved and be able to make that kind of money. It's, okay, it's so, going to be tough. You're going to be hard pressed. Understood. If I'm an OG driver, somebody who's been doing this 20 plus years, yes, I'm making six figures, but this ain't like other industries out there where the higher you climb, the less let's just say blue collar work you have to do the less you get the cushy office in the corner. Oh, no, you're, sir. You're, you're, you're calling the shots. Now you're sitting at the head of the table. Yeah. As yeah. you get older in the trucking industry, especially as a driver, you're going to make the money, but you still going to be doing the hard, heavy lifting to make that money. hundred percent. It's actually exactly the opposite of what you said. Because as you get older, now you have to keep up. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Interesting. Because you got these young cats that are coming in the game that are hustling, and they looking at you, and they're like, I'm going to run circles around you, old dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, in my experience, I've been around a lot of drivers. I've employed many drivers. And the thing is, is these older cats, they, they, they use this. They use this. They know how to use their mind. They they know how to use techniques. They know how to do different things to make to to be more time efficient than a lot of these younger cats. They know the roads better. They know that they know the lanes better. They know how to unload freight in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a better way. They know how to optimize their time because there's a lot of tricks that you learn along the way that a lot of these young guys don't know. They got to learn. So you'll find these cats doing deliveries and you'll see these older guys in their 50s and they're, they're pulling these heavy, you know, totes and pallets. And you're like, man, how you get that unloaded so fast? But that's where the chess comes in. There's a lot of thinking in, 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 in driving, too. It's not just driving a truck. There's 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 a lot of, of, of it's like a, it's, it's like a, it's like chess. You know, when you're unloading a truck and, and, and these different things, you have to really do things a certain way to make 
to, to be as time efficient as possible. Because at the end of the day, time is everything, right? Because a lot of freight is time sensitive. You got to be there on time. And then you got to be to the next place on time. And in between that time, somebody's trying to figure out what you're doing because that time ain't good enough for them. You know what I'm saying? Then you got to think about what you're doing tomorrow. So you have to learn how to master your time and how to be as efficient as possible on the road. And that's the thing that the older guys, that's the advantage that the older guys have over the younger cats. Even though they're older and their bodies aren't in prime condition, their mind is sharp. And they know how to utilize their mind to get ahead. And that's what they have to do at that time. So now you got to think smarter. You got to outsmart your younger opponents in order to, to hang in there. But no, in terms of the work getting easier, nah, bro. If, when, when it's your time, it's just your time. That's it. You know, unless you just transition to a job. So like I said, you're just driving, you're pulled up to a dock, you're dropping off the trailer and you just move on. The way you're not touching nothing, not doing nothing, you just have a nice cush job. You know, that's the only time you're going to be in a situation to where you don't have to really hustle and bustle and really fight for your money. But in order to get paid doing that, now tenure is going to come into play because you have to have been around for a while to be doing that easier work and get paid top dollar. So now they're going to say, all right, well, you've been around for a minute. You've held it down. We'll pay you top rate to do this easy work just because you've proven that you've been safe. You've been compliant. You've been a good driver. So now you get rewarded in that in that way. You understand? Absolutely. Cool. Okay. So, and I think you did a great job just really helping me, and I'm sure you really helped this audience to understand uh, how much you can make, what it looks like, especially as you become an older driver. No doubt. When you're talking about these entry-level fees or OG fees, uh, do I need to have my own truck for this? It, 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 you know, I graduate class and I got my CDL now. Do I get hired and they give me the keys to their trucks? Or they're like, you got to now go out there and buy a truck? Like, if if I have a truck, am I making more? Like, what, what does that look like? Yeah. So, again, it, it, it depends on what your goals are. So, if you're... It, and and the the, the whatever the answer is right depending on the person like whatever you want to do is what you want to do so if you want to just drive a truck for somebody there's nothing wrong with that right if you don't have the aspirations of being an owner and taking on all the liability of 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 owning your own truck right then that's fine you can drive for somebody else and you can make a good living doing that but if you want to take it to the next level and 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 have an ownership stake in it then yeah, it, you you're gonna obviously have to take on a, a lot more, and and that's gonna be you know that's a decision you have to make. But what I always encourage people to do is you know learn. Education is the education is the is the key, man. You have to, and, and it's it's always great. I think personally, in any in any endeavor, to to work for somebody first, right? Work for somebody like a lot of, a lot of times you know people do uh uh you know men, men have mentors. Or, or they'll do, uh, man, it's escaping me. What do they call when you work for free for somebody? A, internships. Uh, intern, internships. Or even if you have a paid position, work for somebody first. And when, while you're working, for while you're working, don't get so caught up in the job that you don't forget to take notes and really study what's going on. Study the processes, study the systems. If you get a chance to look at some paperwork and see what things cost, you know what I'm saying? Find out how those companies run efficiently. What, what are their inefficiencies? What can you improve on? Be in as much meetings as you can. Pay attention, right? You know, when I was working, com coming up, working for corporate, working for companies, that's one of the mistakes I made early is I was so caught up in doing the job for them that I didn't pay attention to a lot of just the behind the scenes things that I could have been well ahead if I would have just stopped and said, hold on, let me just let me just pay attention to that and really study what's going on. Take some notes and just every day learn something new because I'm so busy being mad at just being at work. Right. <laughs> I'm mad. I just got to be there. Right. I'm not taking the time and I'm not using the fact that I'm there to my advantage. Right. So I always tell people, like, when you start a company, start where you're smart. And I say start where you're smart, meaning start where you already have experience. Because in that experience is going to be your network, right? Because you already have people around you that do the same thing, right? It's going to be your customers because now you know all the people that they work with, 
right? So you already have customers when you get started for yourself because you're taking notes. You're, you're taking in everything that's going on around you. So you have to kind of like, it's, it's almost like having like an outer body experience, like get outside yourself for a little bit and look at the operation and figure out what's going on and what's making this thing work. And how are they getting ahead? How are they making their money? You know, do they have multiple contracts? Do they have one? Are they buying their trucks? Are they leasing their trucks? Are they buying their trailers? Are they leasing their trailers? When they have their trucks, how often do they send them for service? You know, when when, when there's a breakdown, what do they do? Are they having people come to the to come to the location of fuel or are we going out to fuel? All these little different things is the game that you could pick up that you're in it and you're doing it every day so you don't think about it pro pro. Uh, consciously, but if you take your time and step back and look at it, you could be building your business inside of their business as you go. And then once you're t- you're ready to spread your wings and fly, you're fully prepared because you've watched them fail. You've watched them succeed. You've watched all the different pieces come together and you know how a successful company works. So there's absolutely like a lot of times now, especially like social media, you know, people are discouraged to work nine to fives. It's like, oh, you got to be an entrepreneur. You got to do that. You got to do this. And I agree that ownership is the key, but don't discount the power of working for somebody because you get to learn off of their dollar. Learn on their dollar. Take that time. And when you're at work, as opposed to being the disgruntled employee, Have the attitude that, yo, every day I'm going to work, I'm really working for myself. They're paying me to learn. If you change and shift your mindset, you'll be in there picking up every little piece that you need to start your own business. And then when you start your business, if you're you're working for a trucking company, don't go and start a barbershop. Yo, start a business that could could, could either add on or add value or help within that same thing that you've already been doing. Because like I said, all the answers are right there for you already. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I think that's a big mistake that we make is we we have everything right in front of us. We just don't utilize it correctly. You, and it's all because of the way we look at things. It's all the way you go into it, the way you go into work. You know, so like there's a saying that says how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, you have to apply that same mindset to work when you're working at nine to five, even if that's not where you want to be. Just be the best worker that you can be and pick up everything that you could pick up during that time and make sure you're not burning bridges. Make sure you're networking, you're talking to people, you're meeting people and every relationship you have, you hold on to that because if your end goal is entrepreneurship, you're going to need all that. You're going to come back to all that. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be there for you because you've been building that all along. That's a part of your entrepreneurial journey by being the, you know, an entrepreneur. You know, working working for the company and learning everything you need to know to, to do your own. So, you know, I think that's really important, man. You sound you sound like Sean Prez, man. Like, 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 <laughs> you said you sound like you're about to take over the Power Move Maker podcast. You dropped so many gems just now. I'm like bad, like bingo, bingo, bingo. Everything you say and the stuff that I try to stress to our audience week over week over week over week. No doubt. Great answer. Okay. <laughs> Say uh, I chose to get my truck, right? I, 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 I decide now, and just truth be told, I didn't realize that once I get my CDL, I can go out there and, you know, they, they would hand me the keys to, to existing trucks and I would just drive the trucks for a company. So that's good to know. But say I decided to get my truck. Right. I, I, I want a little more stake in the game. I want ownership. I want to become an owner operator. Do you recommend a new truck versus an old truck? And either which way, can you give us an idea of what are some of the expenses associated with owning your own truck? Yeah. So in terms of recommending a new truck versus an old truck, it really depends on what your operation is going to be. Right. It, it depends if you're going to if, if you're going to be running local, um, because ultimately, when you purchase a truck, right, th- that truck is only as good as that truck's engine. And at any any given time, right, regard regardless of if it's new, old, any time you could have issues with a truck. Mm-hmm. Right. Obviously, the chances are more if, if it's an older truck. Right. So you have to go into the business knowing that that truck at any point could 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 fail on you and and you'll have repairs so you have to have that money kind of stacked away and be ready for the inevitable right because that's going to happen 
we already know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. Right. So initially kind of get, getting getting started in the trucking business, your initial cost is going to obviously be your equipment, which is going to be that truck. Whether you get an older truck and you spend, you know, 15,000 to, to, to that's that's a really old truck, but to 20, 30, 35,000 on a truck. Right. Or you get a brand new truck. Um, you know, that you, it, it all, de- it really just depends on, on, on your business model and what you, what you want to do. Some other costs, um, is going to be insurance, right? Um, insurance is going to be a, 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 a real, a, a huge expense because as you get into the industry, number one, especially when you're a new authority, right? You're new in business. So again, you don't have that past performance for an insurance company to say, Ah, you know they've been in business for a while. We can trust them. No, the 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 likely there's more of a likelihood that you could have an accident or or something could happen. So your insurance premiums are going to be high, right? So your insurance is going to cost you, um, and just really having that uh, that 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 nest is is what you have to really pay attention to. Making sure you have a, enough money in case something happens. Right. Because to get to get to get started, depending on what you do, you could probably get started in the trucking industry for about 50 grand. You know what I'm saying? Get yourself a decent truck, get your insurance and get yourself started. But again, you know, you never know what's going to happen. That truck, you could have that truck on the road for, for two weeks and it could you could blow an engine. And now you're starting from point A. You know what I mean? So you always want to make sure that you have a nest egg of some capital in case something happens to that truck and you have to either repair it or get another truck or or whatever happens after that. Got you. Um, You know, you just got me to thinking and I don't want to go too far off course. Yeah. But does it make sense? I mean, with all of these trucks on the road, it might make sense for people to learn that business and go into auto mechanic. I mean, mm. you, you keep talking about these trucks. It is inevitable. What you're right for anybody who owns any type of vehicle at some point, that vehicle is going to break down. Right. Um, you know, this is like, again, it's off the beaten trail, but it, it seems like the, those mechanics, it's gotta be a lot of money on that side as well, because all of these trucks at some point are going to need to be serviced. Right. Right. No, 100 percent, man. A, a, a diesel mechanic, to be honest with you, any specialized position like that, like and that's another thing that we're missing, kind of like you, you, we, like you said, we're going off the beaten path a little bit. But let's just let me just drop this in here, too. Mm-hmm. Like there are so many opportunities, you know, with 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 blue collar jobs out here that people are not paying attention to. Right. That are going to be needed in the future. You know, roofers, plumbers, electricians, diesel mechanics. Everybody wants to be everything else except for these jobs that aren't going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. And what's going to happen is these people who are sticking to these trades and who learn these trades, the few that do, they're going to be charging a a heck of a premium (laughs) because nobody's going to know how to do it. You know what I'm saying? So I always tell people, man, like it's dope to want to, you know, create the next Instagram or you know, want to have the next dope podcast or the next dope YouTube channel or whatever the case may be, all those things that, you know, seem cool or have the next Airbnb and all that. But people are forgetting about just the everyday jobs that people need to do in order to just keep society really moving, man. And like you said, a diesel mechanic, that's some, that's a job that's not ever going away. Not going nowhere. (laughs) It's not ever going away. So that right there talks to, you know, you find pain points and you 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 become the solution, right? So if you're in the trucking industry and you know that, man, these trucks are breaking down, hey, maybe you want to shift and say, let me be the, the, the diesel mechanic for all these trucks breaking down. I mean, it, it makes sense to me. You yeah, know what I, I mean, mean, it definitely makes sense. If, if, you know, what we know to be true is no matter how much technology advances, everything moves via trucks that that's factual so we know that industry is only expanding that's a fact but as it expands those trucks are going to break down at some point so you know for anybody watching this if you don't want to be on the road and you are interested in this industry in one way shape or form you might want to look because I, i don't see diesel mechanics that that industry has to be growing along with the trucking industry. Uh, we talked about getting your own truck. You said I can get into this game 
$50,000. What type of truck does that buy me? That's going to buy you an older truck, for sure. I mean, okay, you're not going to get- but There's so many different types of truck. And what I mean by this is, is it a box truck? Is that a nah, trailer? That, that, Again, it depends on what you want to do. So now if you add the trailer, that's 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 another cost too. So okay. all right, so 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 you have box trucks, you have um semi trucks, you know, the combination trucks. Mm-hmm. When I say you get in 50,000, you could you could get in on either of those fronts. If you want to buy a box truck or you want to buy a semi truck, but you're gonna be buying an older truck. A brand new truck could run you anywhere from a hundred to hundred and twenty thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? For a brand new 2022, 20 truck, that, that's what you're going to be paying. Um, and depend, depending on your specs, like if it's spec'd out, you know what I mean? Tr- you know, everything in it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run you some money. So if you're getting an a older truck, that's what I'm saying. Just to get into the game at the bare minimum, that's what you're going to need. Probably around that, that, that 50, 50 grand to be in a, a, a decently comfortable place. And I mean, obviously, there's different ways you could get in. You don't have to spend all your money on the truck. There's different companies that offer financing where you can just, you know, put a down payment on the truck to where as opposed to spending, you know, uh, 30 grand on the truck, you could put down five, six thousand dollars in and walk away with the truck. You know what I mean? It just depends on how you situate yourself in order to make it happen and and, and what your finances look like. Obviously, things play into that, like credit. Um, you know, your, your your personal financial outlook. So it just really depends on where you are at, at, as a business and then what you want to do with the truck. Um, and, and that's really the key. Like a lot of people just think the trucking industry and they're like, all right, you know, I want to get into the trucking industry, but it's like, all right, cool. But you want to get in the truck, but what do you want to do? Like you just now said, box trucks. Box trucks is like what they call like last mile, final final mile, like where you're where you where you're delivering short shorter deliveries, right? Like delivering to houses or going from uh, you know different uh, uh, dock to dock deliveries, and it's it's shorter shorter uh, mileage, and you could do it in a box truck. Like what a box truck basically is is the overage that can't fit on the 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 forty eight foot or fifty three foot trailer. They're putting that on the box truck. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to the same places, but it can't fit on the bigger trucks because it's too much. So now they have to get a box truck and they're going to pay the box truck less. Right. But they still have to get that um, that freight moved as well. So you can do box trucks. Um, that's actually a great way to get started because it's cheaper um, to, to purchase a bo- box truck. And also you can drive a box truck without a CDL, you know, so you could even get into the game without a CDL with a box truck. Um, so, I mean, it just like I said, it's so vast. It really depends on what you want to do, because it's it's hard to give a one size fit all mm-hmm. answer because mm-hmm. it's just so many different niches. You know what I mean? OK, so say I got my truck, <clears throat> right? Just, just for lack of a better example, let's stick with the box truck. Yeah. Driving locally, because I'm assuming box trucks, you're not doing OTR. You, um, you, know, you, do, you do OTR on box trucks, too. Oh, you can do it? OK, yeah, so let's just say local and regional, just for this yeah. example. I'm happy. I now own my own truck. What do I do now? Where, where? Give, give, give me the best places that Sean Prez. I got my truck. I'm happy. I'm, I'm up and running. Right. Where do I find my loads? What, what, what do I do? How do I, like, I, I'm, I'm open for business, guys. Right. I, I'm right. ready to work. Where, where yeah. do I find these loads at? Yeah. So, so there's, so there's two different ways you go about it. The, the one way you could do is what we talked about earlier, where you lease on with a company who already has loads, right? So you could lease lease on your lease your truck on with a carrier, right? Who already has trailer loads to be pulled, and basically you're partnering your business with their business and you're pulling their freight, right? So your expenses are going to be a little bit lower because you don't have to have your own authority to do that. You're going to pull their freight, but you're not going to make as much money up front because they're the middleman. They're getting the freight from a shipper there and then they're allocating that freight to the people who pull the loads for them. Right. So that's one way you can do it. If you want to go out on your own, there's what they call a load board. That's how most people start. Right. So what a load board is, is it's a place where shippers, right, shippers who are places like distribution centers, people who have freight. Give me one second. You, you, you're speaking above most of our heads. OK, Remember, okay. this is one oh one. OK. What is shippers? Okay. Explain all <laughs> got you. different terminology. Got you, got you, got you. So a shipper would be like Amazon, 
right? Amazon could be like an example of a shipper, right? A shipper is a, a, a warehouse with, uh, with, with, with cargo in it and goods in it, right? Whether it's dry goods, whether it's uh, cold store, whether it's cold goods, refrigerated goods, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's a warehouse in a place where there are goods and that's gonna be the shipper, that building that holds all those goods that needs to be put on the truck to go from point A to point B, right? Okay. So who's your carrier? So the carrier is going to be the company that's gonna be hauling those goods, that's gonna be pulling those goods on the truck, right? So the carrier is going to be the, the trucking company, like what's a trucking company you've heard of before? Give me, give me a, a company you've seen on the road. Uh, damn, man. Old Dominion, maybe Swift. Yeah. Uh, JB Hunt. You ever, okay. The, these guys are carriers. Usually like when you see the, the, the sign on the side of the trailer, whatever that name is, that's the carrier. So, so their job is to basically have relationships with these shippers, right? To be able to haul this freight because the shipper just has the warehouse with the freight and they need to get that freight somewhere else. They don't have the truck to do it in some cases. So that's where you come in as a carrier to take that freight from point A to point B. Right. Gotcha. So so in, in some cases, just getting started, it started out. If you get your own truck, you can partner with the carrier, which is what they call leasing on to where you, you you go underneath their insurance and their authority. Right. Their privilege to pull these loads. Right. And you pull loads for them. Right. And, 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 and so that's how you get in. That's how you get your loads. So the relationship there is you have the truck and the driver. They have the relationship with the shipper and the loads. You take your truck and your driver, you go to their shippers and you pull those loads for them. That shipper pays them and then they pay you. Got, Got it? it? All you, right. You started cool. talking about load boards. Can we yep. lock in on that for, for before I move this interview on? Yeah. So so the other way to do it, if you if you do have your own authority. Right. And you're working for yourself. So now you're the carrier. Right. You have your own truck. You have your own trailer. Sean Prez transportation is on the side of the truck. Right. That's when a lot of people use load boards. What load boards are is basically a platform. Right. It's like almost like Facebook. For the trucking industry. Right. You have all the shippers and the brokers. Brokers are people who have relationships with shippers who are brokering loads for, on behalf of the shippers, right? So you have the brokers and the shippers posting their loads on this platform at a price, mm -hmm. right? And they're saying, we're willing to pay you this amount of, of money to haul this freight from point A to point B. This freight will be available on Monday at this time, right? You need this particular type of trailer this particular type of equipment, it has to meet this size requirements. And if you meet all that criteria, you can then bid on this particular freight to run this load for me. So that's what, so, so on the other side, it's a two-sided marketplace. You have the shippers and you have the brokers, and then you have the carriers competing for that freight. So they're getting on the load board. They're saying, all right, let me see. All right, there's a load in Florida that's paying a thousand dollars to go from, and I'm just using numbers here. So, you know, this is just whatever. It's paying me a thousand dollars to go from Florida to South Carolina. And you get on there and you say, all right, that's a good load to me. I'm going to take that. My truck can make money by taking that load, right? So you accept that load. So then the transaction comes to where you reach out to that shipper or that broker and you say, hey, I'm interested in that load, right? And they say, okay, you're interested in it. You can now you can negotiate on price, right? Where you say, I like that low, but a thousand is a little too low for me. I need 1200. They can say yes or no. Once you guys come to an agreement on price, the load is done. They send what they call a rate confirmation, which is basically an acceptance of the 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 that you accept this load and you're taking possession of this load. So now it's your responsibility until it gets to the um, until it gets to point B. Right. And then you take that load. That's how the load board works. And then when you get to that point, you can jump on the load board again or pre plan a load coming out of South Carolina to get you to your next point. So that's how you kind of work the load board. 
what a lot of people like to do is they like to build relationships to get what they call dedicated lanes, which is where they have shippers or brokers that they work with on a consistent basis all the time to where they're not always looking for the work, but they have their work pre-planned for the week or for the month or for the next six months. So they know they're going to be running that same lane every single time. And now they don't have to be searching and finding and negotiating and pretty much bottom feeding because a lot of freight doesn't even make it to the load board. A lot of times freight will make it to the load board after the direct ship, the direct relationships aren't working. The direct relationships don't have enough capacity. So we're going to post this on a load board to see what trucker or what carrier will take it because our direct relationships, we have nobody. We have too much freight. We don't have enough trucks. Now we got to post it. So ultimately what you want to get to is to a point to where you build rapport and you have direct relationships with customers to where you don't have to necessarily use that load board or when you use it, it's a last resort. You know what I mean? Because now you have now you have consistent freight and now you have that relationship to where you know where your freight's coming from. And now you can project your money a little bit better. Right. You know how much you're going to make on that specific lane. You can you, you could, uh, you know, look at, you know, your fuel costs and you could kind of do a, a real live uh, P&L and kind of figure out what you're going to be spending on that lane. And you'll know what your money's going to look like at the end of the week or at the end of the at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So that's ultimately probably where you want to get. But a lot of people start off working those load boards and there's different load boards out there like that. Um, Truckers Edge, like there's, there's there's a bunch of load boards. People can Google load boards and they'll see what they are. But basically what it is, a platform, a two sided marketplace for carriers and shippers and brokers to be able to connect. OK, beautiful. You just answered my next question, which was where the hell do I even find a load board at? <laughs> like. <laughs> So I can go ahead and Google that. Yeah, you Google Google load boards and you'll find a bunch that pop up. Okay. What about negotiating your fee? Mm -hmm. um, what is that based on? And, and, and I, wanna, I want you to break it down, like the pros and the cons, because is there a set fee um, in the industry from driving from one place to another? Do, do the, the drivers charge based on mileage? Is there a pro and a con to that? Is there yeah. a pro and a con to basing your fee on a percentage? Like, what, what does that look like? And, and do Sean, who's just getting into business, do I have any negotiating power? Like, or, or do they look at me like, uh, give me the little pat on the head, like you you should be happy we're even using you. You don't, you don't even have no miles under your belt. Right, so with, with, with negotiation, it's all about like in any business, it's all about supply and demand. Right. If 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 the, the more trucks that are in a particular area, right, if there's more trucks, the the, the shipper or the broker are, are they're able to pay less because there's more supply. The less trucks, they have to pay more because there's less supply. So if you're in a, if you happen to be in an area where there's a lot of freight, but not a lot of trucks, you'll be able to charge more, obviously, because they're trying to get their freight out, but there's no trucks. So if you're the one truck that's there that's going to take it, you could charge a premium because ultimately they got to get that freight move. So you have that negotiating power. On the reverse side, if it's a whole bunch of trucks, right, in a, in a specific area and not a lot of freight, well, if it's a whole bunch of trucks, basically it's, it's, it's reverse to where you can't charge it as much because they you're not the only game in town. If you say no, they can reach out to somebody else, you know, so at that point, they have more flexibility in terms of their negotiating, um, you know, their negotiating power. So they have leverage. You know what I mean? But it's always it's always negotiating. Like they say, you get what you negotiate, not what you deserve. <laughs> you know what I'm gotcha. saying? So it's always going to be negotiating. And that's going to be just based on, you know, the different variables that's go happening at that time, especially if you're working, if you're working a load board, it's like what, based on what's going on at that current moment. Now, you know what kind of negotiating power you have. And on the load board itself, it tells you what the going rate is for the for the for the for the lane. So like when you look at that load, it'll say this load pays typically about twelve hundred. So you have an idea of what you can what you can charge for that rate. But that doesn't mean you're going to you're going to charge that or you're going to get that. 
it's all a matter of what's going on in that current moment and in the market at the time. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It makes plenty of sense. Um, you, you, you mean you you are really taking your time and you're painting a great picture um, for anybody who's a layman like myself to understand. So you, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs> you, 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 you. You mentioned again and again and again during this interview, uh, the shortage of drivers out there. There's a need. Um, but from what I understand, in speaking to, to people who own trucking companies, it is hard to keep drivers. It is hard to, especially hard to keep good drivers. So how, from, from the standpoint of somebody who's looking to hire drivers, what is the best way to recruit these drivers? And then secondly, what is the best way to keep them? Mm. Yeah, so um, that's a great question, man. Driver retention has always been a problem in the industry. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is like I spoke, like I talked about earlier, if you are a good driver with a good clean record, you have a golden ticket, you can go anywhere, right? So you, so pretty much in that particular scenario, the ball is in your court and you have so many options open to you, right? And drivers know that there's a shortage. Drivers know that companies are looking for drivers. So you have to really work hard as a carrier or as a business owner or whatever you do, however you hire your drivers, to, to retain your drivers. Um, so let's start with the first thing in terms of recruiting drivers, because that's the first question you asked. Yep. Um, I've been recruiting drivers now, you know, for business wise for over five years. That, that's why I asked you because I yeah, know yeah, your yeah. background. Yeah. So, so one of the main things you want to look at is, okay, so where are we going to find drivers, right? There, there's drivers are in the same places where you'll find most workers. Um, now you'll find them on Indeed. You'll find them on Craigslist. Um, just to speak to that real quick, I like I like Craigslist uh, because it's cheap. You know, you can get you can get a lot, put a lot of information out there one time. You could co- probably get a lot of hits, and then you have to kind of filter down from those hits. Uh, Indeed is a little bit more professional. It, it costs more for a, a company to use Indeed, and also people who fill out applications on Indeed, probably take their professional career a little bit more seriously than somebody on Craigslist. So you'll probably find more professional drivers on Indeed, not to say that they're not on Craigslist also, but I'm just kind of throwing some things out there to think about, right? So in terms of recruiting, uh, the first thing you want to do is obviously where do, where do you find them? So that's two places where you could find drivers and there's other uh, platforms where you could find drivers, right? Uh the, but 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 the main thing is, you know, once you kind of get them, how do you draw them in, right? H- how do you how do you differentiate yourself or separate yourself from other employers or other companies and and make this make make a driver want to work for you as opposed to somebody else, right? Um, obviously, the number one thing that drivers are uh, looking for is compensation, right? So your compensation has to be fair. It has to be at least fair or above the standard. Right. So you, you, you definitely don't want to go below, especially now where there's so much opportunity out there. You got to pay your drivers. Right. Your drivers should be the your, your, your highest cost in your business. Right. Next would be your insurance. But you have to make sure you pay your drivers. Your drivers are ultimately the bloodline of your business. Without them, you have no business. So. Treat them as such respect, respect that and pay your drivers fairly. So you wanna you you wanna have a fair compensation package. When I say a compensation package, not only uh, th- their their hourly wage or your route pay or however you want to pay them, um, but also, hold on, Sean. Sorry about that. Also within that compensation package, what are you offering in addition to that? Are you offering insurance? Right? Are you offering a four hundred one k? You know, are you offering a uh, 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 like like uh, any other different perks that anybody else isn't offering, right? So you want to have a, a complete compensation package to where not only are they getting paid, but they also have other perks um, in, in in working for your company, right? So that's like the best of basics. So for a trucking company, I'm going to say the main things you want to look for is how's your equipment, 
right? No driver wants to drive a dirty truck. No driver wants to drive an old truck, right? A driver wants to drive a truck that they're comfortable in. They're living in this truck. Even if they're getting home every day, they're, they're on the road for minimum 14 hours a day. They're basically living in this truck. So you want to, you want them to have them comfortable. Make sure that you, you have them in equipment that's clean, that's comfortable, that's well-maintained, right? That has air conditioning, has a refrigerator, like all these little different simple things that a driver is looking for. They just want to be comfortable because ultimately there's, this is their office, right? So they want to, they, they, they want to be comfortable. Have them in a truck that's not breaking down every five minutes, a truck that, you know, you're making sure you're doing preventative maintenance on the truck to where they're not getting flat tires and, and stupid things that could have been prevented if you as the owner were making sure that you were on top of your game, right? So in the industry, they call that like PMs, preventative maintenance. Always make sure your truck is being serviced ahead of time so that it doesn't have to be serviced on the road when the driver is trying to do their job. See, these are all the things that's going to frustrate your driver and make them not want to work for you. So the easier you can make their job, the more they're going to want to stay, stay with you because there could be another person that's going to pay more. But if these other things aren't taken care of, they, they'll probably stay with you because they can say, hey, man, at least I get a fair wage here. I have a nice compensation package. I know my truck is always clean. I know all the work and maintenance is done on my truck. I, I, my AC is always working. All these little little things. It's going to make them say, I'm comfortable here. I'm good. I don't got to look somewhere else because the green isn't always, uh, the, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. You know what I'm saying? So these are like the bare things that you want to make sure you, that you take care of that a lot of people just overlook. And in terms of recruiting, if you're doing that, you want to spell that out in your messaging and let your driver know that that's what you're doing and let them know that that's what's important to you so that when they're reading that description of the job, they could say, oh, man, you know, they like you say, hey, we have well-maintained, well-serviced, clean trucks. Show a picture of the truck. Show them how they'll be living, what the truck looks like inside. You know, paint that picture that working for us, we're trying to make it as convenient for you. You know, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to help you help us. You know what I mean? Ultimately, because we understand that you are the bloodline of our business. So when you can paint that picture for a driver and make them comfortable, they're more likely to stay with you. Secondly, like I said, make sure you're paying them fairly, if not above what they should be getting paid. If you have to cut into your margins to pay them more, do it because that's how you're going to retain them. If they're not there and they don't drive the truck, you're not making nothing, right? So, 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 so have an accountant, have a, 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 a CPA, somebody who could really crunch your numbers and see what's the most I can get away with paying this driver and still make the money I need to make. Because ultimately that driver is my most valuable asset and I need to make sure that they're taken care of. So pay the driver as much as you possibly can, right? And then just be honest with your driver, communicate with your driver. Drivers are so used to being lied to, used to being manipulated, used to being treated like they're, like they're not intelligent, right? Because everybody's trying to run game on everybody to get things done. But the more honest you are with people in general, but specifically with your driver, they're going to trust you. You're going to de develop that trust, trust for better or for worse. Even when those situations come that are difficult and that are bad, it's like they're going to be like, well, at least, you know, you kept it real with me. You told me what it was. I know what it is. I could accept that. But when they start seeing that you're being dishonest with, and you're playing with their money, you're playing with their time. That's when you have that breach in trust and now they start looking elsewhere. And then another, another thing is offer some type of incentive on top of their pay, right? Like remember, and, and small things, a, a gift card for their birthday. You know what I'm saying? A bonus on Christmas. Little small things like that go a long way and it doesn't have to even cost you a lot of money. It could cost you an extra 50 bucks a year. Just say, hey, it's your birthday, man. Here's a gift card, you know, enjoy yourself. You know, hey, man, you did a great job for me. Here's, you know, extra hundred bucks. Thank you so much. Make sure you're giving your drivers raises. Make sure you're, you're constantly, you know, increasing as they do work. Continue to reward them for the work they're doing. And if they see that that's the way you run your ship, then they're going to rock with you, right? And then also another thing is make sure that you have structure in your business, right? Don't run like a, 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 a willy-nilly operation to where you don't have systems in place, 
right? Make sure they know where to submit their pay sheets or their time cards and and, and on time and, and they know what the system is and everybody's on the same page and everything is clicking. All these things are gonna be, when you don't do it is what frustrates the driver, frustrates you and makes the relationship bad. So if you have all these things in place, which is just general business stuff, but that a lot of people just tend to forsake, you'll be, you, you'll be that much more ahead of everybody else because everybody's so quick to try to get to the money. They forget about just the, the basic fundamental things that, you know, you need to have just that, that, that driver owner relationship, man. You know what I'm saying? It's not, like I said, it's not difficult because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's but so much you can do. And the driver understands that you can't give them the world because they know you have to run your operation too. But I always say, just be transparent, be honest, be truthful and show that there's some type of um, uh, like, 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 like there's room to grow within this company. You, you're going to start here, but we're going to try to get you here. And, and when you get there, we're going to keep on trying to raise you higher and keep on offering you more opportunities. And if it's not in pay, offer it through something else, whether it's through a benefits package or through something, but just find ways to offer your drivers as much as you possibly can. And, you know, from an ownership perspective, it's like these things cost. Yes, they do. You know, because it's easier to just say, okay, we don't offer benefits because that's less of a cost on you. So you have to figure out and have a plan to how you're going to scale and how you're going to start offering these things in your business. But it has to be on your roadmap. It has to be something that you know that you're going to do at some point. And you have to communicate these things to your driver in order for them to really want to stick around. And, um, you know, I think and, 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 and then the last thing I'll say is when it comes to recruiting drivers, the most powerful thing is word of mouth. Right. Stronger than any Indeed or Craigslist. The most powerful thing is word of mouth. Dri great drivers flock together like they say birds of a feather fly together. Yeah. It's true with drivers. Drivers know other good drivers and drivers talk. Drivers gossip more than any episode of Love and Hip Hop. <laughs> they talk. You know what I'm saying? So if you run in a tight ship, you taking care of them. They going to let them know if you run in some BS, they going to let them know. Either way, the word is going to get out. So if you're doing a good job and you're doing right by your driver, best believe they have a friend that's being screwed somewhere and they're going to say, yo, come over here with us. They doing it right. And that's how you're going to get your next driver through word of mouth. That's the most powerful thing that we have in this industry. Everybody talks. And if you and if you if you're running the ship to where everybody is happy and like I said, it's not going to always be perfect because you can't make everybody happy, but you're doing your very best. To, to, to offer the drivers the best you can and you're, you're, you're transparent, you're communicating, that that will travel, that word will travel and you'll recruit drivers that way. Most of the drivers that have worked for me over the years have all come through word of mouth. I don't, we don't have to, to put out ads because it's always a friend of a friend who says, yo, my man, he, he need a job too, yo, bring him on. And I know if that driver says that he's good, I'm, I'm already comfortable because if you say it, I know he's good because That's I know good. that, he, I know what, I know that you know what I see in you. So I know that you're going to see, you must see that same thing in them to even bring them on. You know what I'm saying? And most of the, and most of the ways that's how you're going to build your driver pool, especially as a smaller trucking company or a smaller outfit and like staffing, like what I do specifically. Is there a such thing as a union in this industry for jobs? Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's definitely unions. There's definitely, there's definitely unions. unions. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Before I let you go, um, what is the thing that you hate the most about this industry? Mm. Uh, what What is some of the things that drivers should really, really, I, I mean, outside of pay, um, that would really make them think twice about, get, because there seems to be a lot of upside. It seems to be a lot of growth potential. It seems to be a lot of ways for you to expand your career outside of being behind that wheel. What are some things or the number one thing that you could say, I really do hate this about this industry? Mm. Well, that's a great question. And I, and I never thought about that. Uh, I would say that the, the number one thing that I probably hate about this industry is it's extremely cutthroat. And you, it's, it's hard to find honest people in the industry. It's hard to find people who are just trying to be fair because 
a lot of people are just trying to get ahead. You know, they're, they're, they're just trying to, you know, they're driven by money. And, 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 and a lot of times they're driven by money because they're just trying to stay alive or trying to stay afloat. You know, so it's hard for, for, for them to, you know, be ethical and, 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 and have a value system because they're just so busy just trying to stay above water because they're competing with other companies and so forth and so on. And that's the thing about this industry. The, 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 there's, there's no loyalty. There's no, uh, a lot of times there's just no real respect, man. It's just like you got to kind of get in where you fit in and you just got to figure it out as you go along. And you're going to deal with a lot of different characters and a lot of different types of people. Uh, but ultimately, you have to just kind of find your voice and find your lane and do what you do. You know what I mean? And try to like be above that. And sometimes you have to be the bigger person in a lot of cases. And you're going to come across a lot of people, a lot of disrespectful people in, in some cases, like people who don't talk to you, you know, in, in, like 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 like. Like like a man or like a woman, you know what I mean? Because these this is a this is a very old old mind industry. Like it's 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 uh you know and it, it's a lot of people still in it that just have old ways of thinking. You know what I mean? So you'll come across a lot of times where you'll be challenged. You'll be challenged to put your best you know your best face on or your best foot forward, and you have to really like sit back and be like, ah, you know, all right, you know what? You got to focus on your goals and um, it makes it makes it difficult to really build relationships. It's hard to build relationships with people because there's just so many different types of people in this industry that you have to juggle. You know what I mean? Like because a lot of people in this industry aren't happy. And I think that's what it ultimately boils down to. A lot of people aren't happy. A lot of people are overworked. A lot of people are underpaid. A lot of people are just in positions to where. They're doing it because they have to. They don't have a passion for it. They don't love it. And a lot of times the, the, those people are the gatekeepers. Those are the people that you got to get through or get past in order to get what you want. You know, so you have to deal with a lot of different personalities, man. And like you have to have very thick skin in order to to, to kind of get ahead and maneuver through this industry because, you know, it's not going to always be pleasant. Everybody's not of the same mindset. It's not like working for Google or working for Microsoft or something like that. And everybody's like living like laptop lifestyles and everybody's chilling on the beach. You know, every, it's, it's high stress, you know? So you're gonna call a customer and somebody might just hang up on you. Or you may, you know, you may be left on hold for 10 minutes or you may, you know, be treated like you're, you're not trying to help them. It, it, you know what I mean? And, it's, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, there are people who are pleasant, but, but the downside is you'll come across that more often than not. And it's like, you have to learn how to navigate through that to still do business. Because at the end of the day, you're running a business or even if you're a driver, right? Because you'll, and speak from the trucker's perspective as a driver, you've had this, you've, you, you're dealing with all these things all day, right? All these obstacles just from driving, you know, just driving your car from, from, from your house to your office could be a drag, right? Just traffic and, and people got road rage and everything is crazy. So imagine doing that in a big truck, right? <laughs> a, a big long with a 50, 48 foot trailer or a 53 foot trailer and people are cutting in front of you and people are flipping you off. People don't have patience. You're trying to maneuver this same big truck that that's about the, the size of five cars with, with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of other vehicles and nobody has patience for you. So you got to do that all day. And then you get to, uh, you get to your destination and that person doesn't want to, you know, deal with you right now because they're busy because there's some nonsense going on in the warehouse and they're like, wait, and they're giving you an attitude. And you're like, man, I just now I rushed to get here. And they're like, oh, hold on. You know, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and not being understanding of what you've gone through all day. And it could be crazy where you're like, man, this is crazy. But you get used to that. You know what I mean? And if you don't have that thick skin, it's tough. You know, it could be really tough. So I would probably say that's the that's the probably the only thing I hate about it is just that, you know, it, it's hard to build relationships, man. It's, it's hard to deal with people sometimes, you know, but That's once you, understandable. Once you, I mean, it, it is a solitary job. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's a very, but once you develop that mindset, you know, um, <laughs> that's why a lot of truckers like to talk, 
If you ever see a, tr- a truck driver, like just catch him somewhere posted by his truck and you start a conversation, he going to probably talk to you for like three hours because <laughs> like you said, it's solitary. You spend a lot of time by yourself and the people that you do interact with don't want to talk to you because they look at you as somebody who wants something from them. And there's a bunch of other yous who also want something from them and they ain't got the time for none of y'all because they have a boss that wants something from them. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's rough, man. That, that, that's the, that's the toughest part. So mentally you have to prepare yourself for that and understand that that's what you're going to come across. And you really can't, there's going to be no change in that. That's always going to be how this industry is. Understood. Ramel, where can my audience find you at? Uh, man, so, you know, you can find me in a couple of different places on YouTube at Truck and Hustle, T-R-U-C-K, and the, num- the, the letter N, H-U-S-T-L-E, Truck and Hustle, or on Instagram, same thing, Truck and Hustle. Um, any podcast streaming platform, we have the, the podcast, number one trucking podcast for trucking entrepreneurs. We talk to um, dope, the dopest entrepreneurs in the trucking industry from all different disciplines, all different niche, niches. We tell their stories. We try to inspire people. And we also give the information um, to help you get ahead if you want to get into the industry or if you're already in the industry and you just want to learn more. You know, that's ultimately what the platform is about. So you can find me at Truck and Hustle anywhere, man. Or just Google Truck and Hustle and just, you know, click on something, man. You'll, you'll, you'll find us out there. Ramel, I want to thank you. Um, you, you, and I'm definitely going to have you back on the platform. You just dropped so much great information. Thank you so much for, number one, sharing. But I love the way you elaborated on your answers. You really took time to paint a picture so that our our entire audience, whether they are complete novice and are just looking to get in the industry or if they're already in the industry and they're trying to work their way up, you really just spelled it out beautifully. Um, And I think that this is, is, it's gonna be a blueprint. It's gonna be a, a entry level trucking business 101 where somebody can watch this or listen to it and really get a great understanding of the business and if it's right for them. So thank you so much again for for giving me the time, being patient and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. You are a true power move maker and I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Sean, for allowing me to be on your platform, brother. It was was my honor. Uh, I love it, man. I love what you're doing. Keep on doing what you're doing, brother. I've been checking you out, following you. You have some great, great interviews, man. I I love it, man. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you and be well, kid. All right, take care. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.